stories this morning. A memorial service uh, from Bumalanga Department of Community Safety, Security and Liaison spokesperson Joseph Mabuza is currently underway in Bombela in Bumalanga at the Comunio Church. The heat wave conditions in large parts of the country's interior will persist today and are only expected to ease tomorrow. And civil society groups in the DRC have threatened to protest over a decision by the country's electoral commission to postpone the presidential elections in three cities, which are seen as opposition strongholds. A very good morning once again. My name is Desiree Chauke. You're watching The Agenda here on the SABC News Channel. And we have in studio Amnesty International, SG Gumi Naidu, uh, who's here to talk to us about a myriad of issues. And uh, welcome once again, Gumi. And thanks for making the time and uh, allowing us to extend uh, this interview. You hit the ground running, uh, already dealing uh, with uh, issues such as the removal of an honor to Aung San Suu Kyi uh, for her indifference in terms of the, the Rohingya Muslims. Why was that uh, an important issue for you to, to be one of the ones you're starting with as you start in office? Well, one of the worst human rights violations in the world today that we've seen in the last five years has been the atrocities against the Rohingya people uh, in uh, Myanmar, Burma, uh, and uh, the numbers of people that have been murdered, the number of homes destroyed, the act of collusion of both government and military in that in uh, Myanmar has been clear. So we had tried ever since it started to appeal to her. My predecessor went and saw her because mm -hmm. she, like Madiba, was one of few people in the world who had this Top award, Ambassador of, revered. Amb Ambassador of Conscience Award and so yeah. on. And so we appealed behind the scenes meetings and so on. And then when she came out and defended the imprisonment of these actions. two Reuters journalists who were sent to prison for seven years simply for reporting on the issue and for becoming a very strident And the international had to take a stand. We had to withdraw it because, and yeah. we were under pressure to be honest. A lot of people wanted us to do it. It was a significant yeah. action. Yeah. We have John from Utenegg on the line. John, what's on your mind this morning? Uh, I would love to know why is it so difficult for Kumi Naidu to bring F.W. Leclerc, he was a murderer into amnesty, uh, international amnesty before or before the thought or anything because we can't go through with these things and this has got a big effect on us. I would love him to do that. That's the one that I love. John, That's the one on my mind. John, did you say F.W. de Klerk? Yeah, he was a former president of the country. Yeah. That was there was a lot of atrocities happening and people well, killed and all those things. Do you remember yeah, that? Well, I suppose, that time? I suppose, Kumi, this is where we make the line between your work and not interfering with the work, the judicial systems of different countries that you operate in. Sure. Uh, firstly, to uh, the great thing about, if you look at Amnesty in South Africa is that, and, and globally, we've been very open to anyone of any, any conversation. ideology. The only thing we say is you have to be willing to put your life on the line to defend human rights, irrespective of whether those human rights impact on you or not. Yes. So, you know, we recognize that there are people in the world who do not, uh, uh, are not as passionate about LGBTI rights, but that impacts on people in a fundamental way. And as Amnesty, we're going to defend those. And we say to people, even if you're not passionate about this or that right, uh, we have an obligation to defend rights for people so that one day when your rights are uh, in question, other people will stand up for you. But I so suppose John's question uh, brings up the question of when do you consider the work of Amnesty International uh, as having made an impact? When do we say, okay, this is what we can credit to the activities of Amnesty International when we see what sort of outcome? Well, f well firstly, you know, I, I like to say this very strongly. Amnesty and other NGOs are not in a competition to see who does better. Who gets to the right? poll first. Yeah. For me, it's less important whether Amnesty gets uh, credit for this campaign or that campaign. I am pushing for Amnesty to work, uh, and the three concepts is a bigger, 
bolder and more inclusive human rights movement moving, fo uh, moving forward. When I say more inclusive, we want to work with others uh, to actually achieve. And let me say two constituencies which people might get a bit, up, uh, bit surprised by. Yeah. I think we cannot win human rights if our religious leaders do not stand up and speak for human rights. Yeah. Yes, we know that some of the religious leaders have upheld patriarchy and have been against gender equality and women's rights and so on. And yes, they have reservations around LGBTI rights. But on many things, we agree with religious leaders. And what, what I'm saying is that religious leaders must step forward. The silence has been deafening. And to people who are in the secular side, we must engage with people who command a lot of constituency. It doesn't mean if we sit and talk, that means we agree on everything. Yeah. But we must learn to respectfully disagree on the smaller number of things where we have disagreement while we work together on the larger number of things where we agree. Can I ask you specifically, though, just to satisfy John's question, because I don't want him to think yes, yes, he's I'm called not, not in and we've disregarded yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Is it at all a conversation in the NGO space, especially the human rights NGO space, uh, the fact, the, not the fact, the, the assertion that uh, Evier de Klerk committed human rights atrocities? Uh, well, listen, uh, no question that uh, F.W. de Klerk uh, was part of a government for many, many years that, con uh, th that uh, committed horrific atrocities. That, that, that's not debatable. Um, was de Klerk a complex person of history who at a particular moment when the writing was a, on the wall that took a decision that, that, that a change had to come. Some people say well de Klerk really was not as courageous as people might think the decision yeah. had been made by the resistance and so on. He had but no the choice. human rights abuse side. And, and, and then the question is should people who committed atrocities during the apartheid area, uh, era. era, whether they gave instructions like the Clark and political leadership might or whether they directly con uh, conducted it, at which point do we forgive and move on? And I think the Truth and Reconciliation Commission process here tried to provide us with a frame of if you came forward, took responsibility, we can move on. But the reality is we know many people didn't come forward and take responsibility. The compensation for the families that lost loved ones was minuscule or uh, not there. And so while the TRC process might have been an imperfect one, uh, at least it was an attempt. And many countries around the world are inspired to try similar things as they are doing in Colombia and Peru and other places where they've been through conflict. Let's hear what Dan has to say from Soweto. Very good morning to you, Dan. Good morning. Uh, Desri, I just wanted to congratulate uh, Kumi for his appointment. Uh, I just want to say to Kumi that uh, this is part and parcel of contributing in the struggle in a different way. The most important thing for me is just to indicate to the listeners and the, and the, uh, and the uh, yeah, 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 listeners that uh, with us when we were in Roman Island, we were quite young that time, uh, Kumi, because we had uh, student activists who were arrested in the Transvaal that time, in the Free State, in Cape Province, and also in Natal, before the current dispensation. So what we had was an influx of young student activists who flooded the gates of Roman Island. Now, the organization that was able to assist in terms of ensuring that uh, all prisoners, political prisoners, and most in particular the young people who were arrested, you know, removed from their and, the and uh, in and the prison, tortured, and everything, we actually received a football kit from Amnesty International. We received books to study from uh, Amnesty International. We received chess board and uh, we also received tennis rackets and balls. So to some extent, Amnesty International was able to contribute to the sanity of South African youth who were imprisoned by apartheid. Having said that, uh, uh, Kumi, I also want to flex the very current problem that South African youth are facing, most in particular student activists of uh, CISMAS 4. 
You know that there are some of them who have been arrested in prison, some of them who are facing trial, and some of them who are restricted. Now, as the June 16 Foundation, June 16, 1976 Foundation, I'm actually the deputy uh, chairperson of that foundation. We are going to be trying to approach the authorities in order to give amnesty to the student activists who have been arrested through the thief asphalt activities. We wouldn't mind uh, to participate together with Amnesty International Johannesburg region in order to approach the authorities to grant amnesty. I'm not quite sure if you think this is one of the most feasible uh, programs or campaigns that your organization can can yeah. be able to participate in. Fortunately, June 16 Foundation is a fairly traceable uh, organization. Yeah. I'm sure you so can I, reach I, out. I have to ask, is this Dan Monsisi? Was the caller Dan Monsisi? Dan, are you still there? Yes. yes. Ah, hello, my brother. Well, yes, I, I, yes, I, I, should say, I should say Dan is about 10 years older than me. And as a young Are activist... Are we counting? <laughs> no, no, no. No, because That's as a young bad. activist, I read about uh, yeah. Dan and Mati De Seco oh, wow. and all the Soweto resistance leaders of the 76, 77 And he's period. echoing what you were saying, and, and, that and, this and, is a and continuation. And I like the idea very much, Dan. Uh, I will uh, be in touch via Amnesty International South Africa office and the Southern Africa office. It sounds like... Uh, a really positive thing for us to work together and we would like to pursue that and my brother it's an honor for me to speak to you and I appreciate so much you you calling in and, and know that you helped shape me and many other people's lives by stepping out earlier and showing courageous leadership uh, in your life thank you very much All right, we've lost Dan there, but what a beautiful conversation. And again, like I said, echoing what you said at the beginning, that it's a continuation of the efforts. Yeah, no, listen, I mean, none of us in the old days when we were going every other weekend to funerals, burying people who were murdered by the regime, we weren't saying that we were fighting simply for us to have the right to go vote every four or five years yeah. and cast a ballot. Absolutely. Our struggle was about decency. It was about whether people have decent work, decent education, decent uh, health care, decent housing and so on. And if we look, you know, at the Freedom Charter that was, that inspired us, you know, yeah. it was about, you know, there shall be housing security and comfort It's amazing all, that you recognized you know, him though. Uh, no, no, I, I mean, listen, yeah. uh, his voice, no, because of course, uh, I, I, when the South African Youth Congress was being set up in, 1980, in the 1980s, after everything else had been banned, I was in meetings with Dan, you yeah. know, like uh, okay. clandestine meetings nationally. Let's go to uh, George. To, George is to, calling to from Johannesburg, and I think I want to encourage our viewers, if you're calling in and you represent uh, a certain movement or, or, or social awareness, let us know. But George in Johannesburg, what's on your mind this morning? Uh, good morning. I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Kumi a question related to DRC. Uh, is he aware of what is happening there currently? Because human rights are violated. And uh, is there something or anything they, they, uh, they are planning to do to prevent more than what is currently happening in DRC? So thank you very much. The DRC is of major, major concern, has been uh, not only for amnesty, but for a range of human rights movements across the continent and the world. Uh, I should tell you that uh, I know there's a conversation that is going on as we speak between Africans Rising for Justice, Peace and Dignity and uh, Amnesty International Regional Headquarters in uh, Nairobi, which focuses on uh, DRC. We have various uh, researchers and so on trying to uh, be on the ground to support uh, folks on the ground. We are deeply concerned about the postponement of the voting in three cities that was announced less than 48 hours ago, and they are all, uh, you know, in uh, opposition strongholds. I think uh, people must remind themselves that President Joseph Kabila has been dragging this on. Yes. This, this, uh, date is another postponement from years back, right? So one message that must come out here is that uh, uh, none of our leaders are indispensable. We need to say to 
the Kabilas, the Mosawenis, uh, the, even the Paul Kagamis of the world, and so on, that you should not be changing constitutions to extend your life in prison. And for the DRC, you know, this is the thing that hurts me the most. Africa is perpetually portrayed as a poor, desperate, bankrupt continent. But let's just be clear. Africa is the richest continent underneath the ground. You name it, we have it, right? And precisely because we are so resource rich, too many of our leaders have made deals with powerful people in yeah. rich countries around the world, and they have prioritized their own wealth accumulation against that of the people. So, uh, yeah, in, uh, and the DRC, more so than any country in the world, right, is one of the most wealthiest countries, yeah. and that is why there's a, also we, in how we analyze what's going wrong there, we also need to analyze the, implicit, uh, the, uh, the, the culpability of powerful foreign governments that are playing uh, political football because of things like cobalt, yeah. which you need to build uh, cell phones, cell phones yeah. and 50% supply of cobalt or more is in the DRC. At a global level, we have Amnesty International and all those other NGO and activism bodies locally we also have that every country has that why is it so difficult to lobby uh, governments and to finally have decisions why is it taking so long to convince joseph kabila that it's time to go because far too many of them have far too little competency to do anything else but to capture power and cling to it because they actually don't listen the only profession in the world where well, you don't need any qualifications is to be a politician. Just need to put your hand right? up. Uh, so, so, you know, it's the one thing where they don't ask you how much of education you got, uh, what experience you've got. But how so. does this speak to the level of activism these days so, and the commitment? Well, this is, this is a key question because I want to humbly say that just as those of us in the activist community say to business and government, in the face of climate change, in the face of deepening inequality, in the face of rising conflict, that it cannot be business as usual. Yeah. We in the activist community have to also say it cannot be activism as usual. And I want to say there are two big changes that we as activists need to make. Yeah. One is we need to challenge the narratives that we are promoting. What I mean by that is, for example, we need a challenging narrative that speaks to the reality of the moment and you can take one from uh, Martin Luther King when he said in 1965 uh, we should refuse to adjust to an economic system that takes necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few when millions of God's children are smothering in an airtight cage of poverty yeah. in an affluent yeah. society. So we have to address the question of how do we share resources on a finite planet, right? So that is something we, we must be willing in a civil society to say the current economic system is not working. And far too many of us are, you know, if you have a bank account, you are in that economic system, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the other thing that uh, the civil society has to do is to also ask ourselves whether we've become too timid, whether in fact we have become too bureaucratic. That is a real right? problem. Because what happens is, if you look at many of us, we spend far speaking too many time... Speaking out and taking a stand. Speaking to government people. Like, I mean, you, it is so sad for me that so many meetings... Why is that I, the I case, do, though? Like, for example, I had a meeting with President Macron two weeks ago. Right? Yes. Um, together with a few colleagues. And I, Whose position is also very uncertain right now. Yeah, and this was in the run-up to the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And, you know... I was thinking going into the meeting, there was a lot of, you know, of course, there's always security and, you know, big fuss about how do you get into the yeah, uh, yeah. government building and so on. And while I was going through all of that, I was just thinking, you know, the sad reality is President Macron knows exactly what we're going to say to him because these people have advised him. Yeah, yeah. And we know exactly how he's so going to respond. So you can't bring up No, no, issues. we also know roughly how he's going to respond yeah. because we also have the analysis and the intelligence. So... We have to recognize that what Albert Einstein said many years ago when he said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting to get different so results. So in the context... If we don't yeah. change, we are basically acknowledging that we are insane. Yeah. We have to look at new ways of doing things. And, 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 I, I, and I have to say that most of our political leaders today and business leaders 
are sleepwalking us into a crisis of epic proportions because, you know, people must be clear, climate change does not threaten the planet, right? We continue on this way, what will happen? We warm up the planet where we will be gone as humanity. The planet will still be here. The struggle to avert catastrophic climate change is about protecting our children and their children's futures. And at this Christmas period, I say to every parent and every grandparent on our continent and globally, yeah. ask yourself the question, have you educated yourself about what climate change means to your children and your grandchildren? And if not, do so and get involved right now because one day they will turn and say to you, what did you do when the writing was a wall and when it was getting too late? And you don't want to be in a position to say, I did nothing. In fact, I wanted to say at the beginning of the conversation that back home, especially in Chatsworth, they celebrated your success. And now we have Seth on the line from KZN. Seth, what do you want to say? Um, um, I want to speak to Naidu. I saw the power of Amnesty International. Um, let, let, let me reduce my volume. All right, we have a bad um, line. Nine to ten years ago, nine to ten years ago, can you hear me? We can hear you now, Seth. Yes, nine to ten years ago, we saw the powerful Amnesty International when they stood up for the refugees, one of the refugees in Zambia who were to lose, who lost their status actually, but were to be forced to go to Rwanda, a city called the Clean City, but it built on the from apartheid where people are not free. Those refugees are still in Zambia. They have lost their status. They are stateless for more than ten years. Is there any plan really to make any further intervention to give them their freedom? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that is such an important conversation. There's so much to talk about. We probably will not be able to get to everything. But the refugee conversation is a global one, although Absolutely. he's specifically referring to Zambia. Absolutely. Let me just say that uh, when the current conversation about refugees happens, it's all about migration to Europe and, yeah. and, and, and what a big burden it is to the, uh, to the government of Europe and so yeah. on, right? Uh, just to be clear, the African continent hosts significantly more refugees than Europe does. South Africa if you is just an example. Go, South Africa is an example. I was in Kenya 10 days after I started my job in Katumo, uh, 300,000 people and so on. But I can tell you this much, going to a refugee camp in the island of Lesbos in Greece uh, two months ago, I saw levels of suffering and neglect oh. and so on. You would be shocked to know that this is happening on European soil. Yeah. And, and let's be clear, the European refugee, sorry, the international refugee conventions were designed around the time of the Second World War to protect Europeans who were migrating from uh, Nazism and fascism in Europe. And if it was a right for Europeans to be beneficiaries of this uh, international refugee thing. Right now, if the conditions are the same, that people in Africa, Syria, Latin America and so on are suffering, then we expect, we demand in fact, Europe to be consistent. And thankfully, the majority of the people in Europe still are more open. Sadly, there are some extremely What's Amnesty conservative International doing governments. in that Oh, so space. we have launched a major campaign called be there, right? So what, what we are doing with the Be There campaign is to take the entire refugee experience from start to finish, from the push factors. Why do people think about... Why do you leave your about, country? Right, you know, and Why let's do you see. think about? Yeah. So you take it that far so, back. So basically we're looking at that old chain yeah. from prevent, you know, helping people to maybe survive in their own context and looking at how do we support people ac across the journey. This is our biggest campaign right now um, in terms of effort to ensure, because the scale of it. Yeah. So we are in virtually every refugee camp around the world where we are supporting um, people. The, I, I should tell you, when I went to Lesbos, I went with five colleagues right in the Greece camp, uh, and all of them were from Europe. I was the only person not from Europe. When we entered through that heavy fortified gate, they let all my friends, uh, all my colleagues through, and, and the security denied me entry. Because? Uh, because they thought I was a refugee. 
and then everybody walked through. And I'm proud to be a refugee. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong. I was uh, fled into exile as a 22 years uh, person from the apartheid South Africa. So, so, but, but I'm just to tell you, you know, Kumi, those that kind the racism of that, yeah. that pervades our world is still In sadly alive ways. and kicking. We talk about these stories in the news on a daily basis. We talk about Syria, we talk about Mexico and the US. We talk about what's happening in the DRC. What is it like to experience it firsthand? You know, I tell you, some of the things that I saw, if I can make a connection with Syria, uh, and, and because you know, we talk about refugees, usually refugees are those that have got out of the country but do you know in many countries now we are also dealing with a similar catastrophe called IDPs, which stands for Internally Displaced Peoples. Mm -hmm. So I uh, went with the, the Amnesty team to Raqqa, Syria, uh, two and a half months ago. Uh, I have to say I've seen some horrific things in my time. I had never seen uh, the kind of devastation and the sad reality is that ISIS the number of people ISIS killed. Does it strengthen your resolve to fight on, or do you think it's a hopeless situation? You know, that's a good question. It does overall strengthen it. But I would be lying to you if I said to you that you don't break. A little bit. Uh, I had a personal tragedy a year ago. My elder sister was suddenly diagnosed with brain cancer and, was, and left us within like just over a month. Condolences and, for and, that. And, one, and we're just celebrating the first or commemorating the first anniversary of her passing. And when I was in Raqqa, one of the things that people wanted to show us was the mass graves. And, they, and there were six bodies that had been recovered that day. Yeah. And these people were working Completely with, stripped with of so dignity. little resources, are trying to give as much dignity to these people who were buried yeah. in mass graves. And so they open each uh, you know, bag to say, well, see, this is a baby because the skull is so thin and, and, and so on. And, and, and when they got to this woman who, because your flesh decomposes in a year, but your air takes longer to decompose. And so they said, see, this we know is a woman, probably this age and so on, and, and her air was intact. And obviously I had okay. a deep association. When we commissioned so, this interview, so, so we didn't know it was meant to make us cry. No, no, but, 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 but this take is a, a call yeah, from yeah, Rose. But, but, but what I'm saying is people <laughs> should understand yeah. that this is not, this is about emotions. That it is. we must not become dehumanized. We must not become dehumanized by suffering. And sadly, during the anti-apartheid period, some of us got dehumanized. Okay, let's take a call from Glose in the Val. Glose, what's on your mind this morning? Thanks for holding. Yes, oh, greetings to you and uh, greetings to Kumi uh, Congratulations to him as well on his election. But I suspect that the greatest challenge that is posed to Kumi Naidu is the African question, in particular the question of Swaziland and the question of the Western Sahara. I think Amnesty International is the only organization that has a very comprehensive report in terms of the situation in Swaziland and bringing about democracy. One would like to know, in uh, the tenure of Kumi Naidu as the Secretary General of Amnesty International, are we likely to see anything in terms of a, or an escalation in terms of the call of de democratizing Swaziland and number two in terms of the question of Western Sahara since well it remains the last uh, colony in Africa that is colonized by an African country on top of that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that amazing call. He's speaking about a comprehensive report, and one of the aspects of Amnesty International's work is research, so that there's detail into what you do. Just in, in, in answering his question, let's talk about the research yeah, you do so, as well. So part, I went, part of the reason I went to Raqqa, Syria, uh, even though it's still you know, in a very precarious situation, was to look at how my colleagues do research in very... Um, hostile environments and I was really impressed with the meticulousness with the GPS you go and you l locate every building and the people that we met with um, family members who yeah. lost everybody and so on it was quite uh, traumatic to, to have those conversations but the research is a very powerful thing 
that when we sit at the UN or wherever, I was amazed that, like, you know, I'm addressing a meeting at the UN on the death penalty and eight governments in the audience, when they speak, they all are quoting Amnesty International research documents because, you know... So la, there's la, your la, impact. La, la, like, for example, with the Rohingya situation right now in, yeah. in, 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 in uh, Myanmar, obviously 99% of our criticism has gone against what has happened to the Rohingya people. However, some people get upset with Amnesty because when a small number of the Rohingya activists engaged in activities that also violated human rights, we will bring out a report and say that. Or, for example, with yeah. the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, of course, most of the time, most of the atrocities are committed by the Israeli state. But when Hamas does it, we'll criticize Hamas as well. So, so that's something that we do. With regard to Swaziland, um, I should just say that, uh, Glosey, I don't know whether you knew a guy called Jack Governor, uh, who was uh, uh, a relative of mine who lost his life in, in, in Swaziland supporting Podemo and, and so on. I think definitely it has been pathetic yeah. how the South African government uh, as, and SADC as a whole has allowed certain horrific atrocities to continue in places like Swaziland. I hope that Amnesty will contribute to a positive outcome and more human rights and justice for the people of Swaziland. So this position that you're taking up at Amnesty International is also an executive position, which means at some yeah. level you'll be bogged down by You've administration. You've got to do the boring stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How will you balance out? So, so far it's Staying been Staying relevant and... Uh, so right now uh, that's a big challenge um, because there's so many things that are going on in the world right now. I could be spending, you know, 200% of my time externally. But there is also a 6,000-person organization to run in every continent, in every time zone, yeah. and so on. So thankfully, I have a great team of people uh, who have been, you know, some new, some have been there for a long time, and so on. And, uh, and, and the short answer is, how do I balance the two would be with extreme difficulty. <laughs> it's, not, it's not easy to that's do. Such an, uh, that's yeah. such a short answer. Yeah. It, it's not easy to do. It's not yeah. easy to do. Uh, and uh, but what I'm doing right now is reviewing the senior management structure of the organization okay. to try to come up with the thing that allows me to fight on the external side as much as I can, but make sure and that I'm having. Continue to be an activist. And, and yeah, because yeah. because my uh, brother once said to me, you know, when I was when I was going to Greenpeace and I was dis, uh, uh, dis, so he asked me about a year afterwards, explain to me what your day looks like. And then he said, my God, that sounds bureaucratic. He said, you went to Greenpeace as a activist. To be an administrator. No, he, he said, you went to Greenpeace as an activist. Please don't come back as a bureaucrat. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of talk about the fourth industrial revolution. How are you incorporating that into uh, the amnesty of the future? So we don't have a choice but to incorporate it, not just amnesty of the future, but amnesty in the present. Absolutely. So uh, at two levels. One is operationally, how do we use the new tools of technology, especially social media and so on, to mobilize, inform, organize, and, and campaign, right? So that's happening at a fantastic level. We've seen it in many countries around the world and so on. But more long-term, and, and it's with us right now, is what are the implications for artificial intelligence, robotics, and so on. Now, some people presented it only in a positive way, and some people presented it only in a negative way. So what we are doing right now is doing work around artificial intelligence, for example, to try to see what are the good things in it and how can we bank that and protect Be that. Be able to do advocacy from a distance for argument's sake. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, but you know the problem is, you know, right now, you know, any intelligence agency wants to know every single thing that you did. They can, uh, you know, CIA, MI5, all the big ones, uh, KGB, uh, K, uh, FSB in Russia and so on. They can figure it out. This is higher grade for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, but, but no, no, seriously, you know, because. Okay, the we're just about to wind up. It. So we have Ibrahim from Western Area. Ibrahim, what do you want to say to Mr. Naidu? Ibrahim? 
All right, Ibrahim is not there. We were talking about incorporation of the fourth industrial revolution. One case that has uh, caught my attention is the one in China about Dragonfly and Google uh, going beyond governments and talking to corporates and fighting corporates as well. Tell us about the details of that case. So, so in a nutshell, basically, uh, the Chinese government has been very anxious about what search engine it tolerates and allows within China, okay, uh, for some time. Uh, there are certain things that are blocked in China, like uh, Twitter and Facebook and so on. Right? I know, it was right? very frustrating and So Google trying to penetrate that market was trying to work with the Chinese authorities to come up with something that will be acceptable to the Chinese authorities and will allow them to continue to do their business and grow their wealth. Yeah. So there was a campaign that Amnesty and others launched against this search engine called Dragonfly. And I want to pay tribute to thousands of employees of Google who joined us, oh, came, really? out, oh, came wow. out and said, we don't want to be we associated won't stand with for this. this. And as far as we know right now, that Google is saying that Dragonfly is off the table. Uh, I mean, when we launched the campaign, the CEO was saying, no, no, this, we are, it's not yet a done deal and so on. Now they are saying it's not happening. We will be vigilant on this and we'll continue to watch this. What we say to governments basically is the internet is not something you should try to, con uh, to, to, to control. Allow it to be they part of the to. global uh, yeah. commons. Uh, oh, listen, uh, to be fair to China, We've had some better examples of uh, internet control on this continent, like in Cameroon, yeah, yeah. where in the English-speaking regions, when President Paul Bia wanted to uh, silence Cameroon folks, hasn't really been a, they shut down a good completely, citizen in, completely, in that term. But let's take Ibrahim. Ibrahim, I hear you're back. Yes, I'm back, thanks. What are, what's uh, on your mind? Good day to you, and thanks for taking my call. Uh, I just want to congratulate Kumi there and also that try and raise an issue. Perhaps maybe they can help us here on this issue. We know that there are students who are marching all the way from KZ to the union buildings regarding the arrest and incarceration of uh, Kanya Kageshe, who was an activist and is serving ADHJ10 for the actions that have happened during that course. So we are calling on the Amnesty International to at least come in and see how they can help in this situation because this, this, this is not an activity by the young men or by the All right, that that line, young That line is not ideal. So um, if you can hear me, I'm going to ask you to go onto their website because we're about to wrap up this conversation. Amnesty International has a South African representation and a global representation. So they can either contact the South African office or the global office, whichever um, is, yeah, this is more accessible. Yeah, it's better to start off with the South Africa office. Uh, Ibrahim, uh, sorry I couldn't hear your question clearly, but please, uh, uh, the Southern Africa office, which is the international secretariat, is also in Joburg. Uh, and uh, please reach out. We would love to engage with you and others. And, and what I would say again to South African citizens and people all over the continent, uh, you have an opportunity to contribute, yeah. to make a difference. Uh, it is much better, as my late mother used to say, to try and fail than to fail to try. Uh, it doesn't m matter that you participate in a campaign and you don't win the first time. Uh, it's it, okay. Just stand and, and, for and, something. And, and take me as an as, as a example. <laughs> most of the campaigns that I've been involved in One since I was 15, One day we'll invite I've you to look at your failures. Them. I've lost, I've lost <laughs> most of Today is not them. that day. <laughs> so, so it's okay to uh, be comfortable with uh, defeats because you can rest assured that history, justice, and those up. that believe in God, God is also on your side. <laughs> but now, how do South Africans support you in this quest? At the end of your term at Amnesty, how should we remember your time there? I think, to be honest, it's, it's less about me and my, I'm not into legacies and so it on. It usually is about the, the, the leader, though, isn't yeah, it? No, but no, no. As and, well. And that's what we have to change, right? That's what we have to change. We place too much of, in, uh, of faith in individual leaders. And whether they get sick or whether they go corrupt or whether they you know, have an affair, whether they, whatever goes wrong, then suddenly we're in a crisis because we are, you know. So We what need I to say, wrap quickly. What are the hot spots throughout the world that we should be looking out for in 2019? Okay, I think in terms of countries and regions, 
I think we need to look at the madness of the presidency of Donald Trump and what impact that's going to have next year. I think you're going to see the Donald Trump uh, presidency unraveling. unraveling. Uh, secondly, you have to watch Brexit and what implications it has on immigration and, and Europe and so on. We must watch Saudi Arabia because if justice is to be served, the crown prince should be fired and put in prison for the horrible act against a journalist in his embassy. And in only activism Turkey. can bring that about. Yeah. Uh, I think we've got, I mean, sadly the list is much longer. Uh, there are many countries, you know, whether it's Egypt, whether it's Here Cameroon. on the continent? Uh, in the continent, DRC, I think because of the elections. That's immediate. Be, uh, immediate. Uh, Cameroon, especially the situation in the Anglophone part is, is critical. Central African uh, countries, especially Central African Republic, Chad Nobody's so been on. talking about the Central African yeah, Republic. They, they are like a little bit under the... Uh, but lots is happening uh, there. A lot is happening there, yeah. Yeah. So, so there's, for anybody wanting, if anybody is bored in South Africa on the African continent, let me just say you don't have an excuse to be bored. There is many ways you can contribute. Don't allow anybody to convince you that your participation, your voice, and your contribution cannot make a difference. Because indeed, in history, it is the contribution of ordinary people that make the most difference. So I hope many people join Amnesty or other human rights efforts and get actively involved in the struggle to save their children's futures. Kuminaidu, it's been awesome. Thank you. And we wish you all the best. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. That's Kuminaidu, the Secretary General of Amnesty International. Just started in March and already so busy.